Hello and welcome to a new aircraft tutorial and today we take a look on the BF109 F4. I would say the best one-on-one -on -one fighter we have in the game with distinct advantages over the enemy. Some real-life pilots consider it the pinnacle of the BF109 design and I personally tend to agree here. So we will talk about an aircraft which gets used very often in the game, while we talked in the past about two fighters which weren't that popular. This is very different with the F4. A properly flown F4 is really hard to shoot down. However, despite of this, I see many virtual pilots struggle to be aware of those advantages and how to exploit them. That being said, the F4 does have some weaknesses the enemy can exploit. And in this video we will take a closer look at all the stuff you need to know to pilot the BF-109 F4. If you take a look from the outside, the F4 looks in my opinion very aerodynamic, aggressive and dangerous. I can tell you, if I fly Russians and I see that propeller hub coming closer with that 20mm cannon in the middle, it's really impressive and uh, the F4 really has some aggressive looks to it, I think. Even though the aircraft is pretty small if compared to its contemporaries, typical features of the 109s are the thin long fuselage with those thin long almost rectangular wings and on the ground you will notice the narrow landing gear which gives the 109 the, at least for new pilots, unforgiving taxi, takeoff and landing characteristics. As soon as you sit Behind the stick and in the cockpit you see that the 109 was a very early fighter design if that makes sense, at least by World War II standards. The cockpit doesn't really live up to the looks from the outside. The view to the side is okayish, I mean you can see properly to the side, but the view to the rear is really bad, especially if you equip the armor backplate. And it doesn't really help that the cockpit frames are thick and are blocking the view to different angles all around. That being said, you can look around those bars, but it doesn't get really pleasant to say at least, especially compared to some fighters who have a bubble canopy in the game. What is nice if we now take a look at the instrument panel that the F4 has basically all indicators you need in a flight. In the top row we have our trusty ammo counter which was really a luxury at the time. The outer stripes of the counter resemble the machine guns on the cowling and the inner stripe resembled the 100 rounds of the 20mm cannon. So if you fire, the white stripes are wandering down. And as soon as there is nothing white visible anymore, the guns are empty with the exception of the cannon counter in the middle. That one resets after you spend 100 rounds for another 100 rounds, so it goes back up basically again. In the middle row we have from left to right the altimeter, the compass, and the manifold pressure. In the lower row we have the speed indicator, the tunnel bank indicator, the RPM and then the prop pitch indicator. The propeller pitch is automated in the BF 109s and if you want you don't have to think about that any further. However the automation can be switched off and managing the prop pitch by yourself can be advantageous in a handful of cases like in an emergency or if you want to save fuel for example. If the indicator is displaying something around 9 o'clock, the propeller weights are coarse and very aerodynamic for high speeds and around 12 o'clock the blade angles are fine, for example for takeoff and acceleration. You see for example that the BF109 sets up a prop pitch beyond 12 o'clock before you take off. Further to the right of the prop pitch indicator is the temperature indicator of the coolant. In the real BF-09 F4, the pilot was able to switch between the temperature indicators uh, for the water and the oil. But sadly, in Battle of Stalingrad, we don't have that option. We only see the temperature of the water, the coolant, which is in most cases enough as the radiators are controlled automatically, so in most situations you don't have to care about temperatures. However, if you are losing coolant, take care that the indicator doesn't touch the red marking. Basically, as soon as the indicator reaches um, the red marking, the engine ceases within some seconds, maybe a minute or so. 
Below the temperature gauge we have the fuel indicator which displays the entire 400 liter fuel load of the F4. So there is no extra tank somewhere, it's really the complete load. For a new pilot the design can be confusing because every marking in the indicator resembles 100 liters of fuel. But the distance between the marking varies. So the indicator needle moves sometimes faster and slower in dependence how much fuel is in the fuel tank. But the consumption is of course stable. So the entire fuel load gives you around one hour of flight time in a usual combat sortie. But that can be immensely increased by flying economically on throttle settings below 1.0 ATAR. So basically you can say between each marking are roughly 15 minutes of flight time. As soon as the engine is running you get the F4 going by throttling up to 1500 rpm and as soon as you are moving throttle down to roughly 1100 rpm. This keeps you going while not getting too fast. The F4 has tow brakes with which you can control the brakes of the left and right wheel independently. Apply carefully the right toe brake and right rudder to taxi straight for example. To turn in sharper turns or on the spot you have to unlock your tail wheel. This is done by just pressing the unlock tail wheel button once. So this makes the tail wheel move absolutely freely in every direction. To turn now just hold the left or right toe brake and throttle slightly up. Sometimes it helps to use the rudder as well. Use the throttle very, very carefully when the tail wheel is unlocked, otherwise the danger of ground loops is very high. I personally like to lock the tail wheel again if I have to taxi straight. Some other pilots just keep the tail wheel unlocked for the entire taxiway. So I guess this is personal preference again. But uh, if you lock the tail wheel, in my opinion it makes the ground handling a bit more stable and easier. To properly lock the tail wheel again, just press the button once and then you have to roll a few meters straight so the tail wheel can align with the fuselage and then it automatically locks. With the techno chat enabled you get a message on your screen as soon as the tail wheel is locked again. Generally speaking, key to go taxiing is to take your time and to be patient. What helps me being patient is keeping the RPM between 1000 and 1500 RPM. If you hold it there basically you can't taxi too fast. Common mistakes while taxiing are that the pilots are taxiing too fast, that they throttle up too high, that they use only rudder to turn, that they don't know about the tail wheel or that they don't lock the tail wheel again while being too fast. That those are basically the most common mistakes I see on a daily basis. But let's talk about uh, the takeoff now. First you have to check for incoming traffic. For first of course uh, for the close end of the runway but important as well is the far end zoom in to check if there's any incoming traffic, if uh, somebody has to do emergency landing or similar. Um, but then of course taxi on the runway, align yourself with the runway, lock the tail wheel and close your canopy. If you want you can use a little bit flaps but they are generally not needed for the takeoff. I personally apply around 80% right rudder just before I throttle up to full power. Therefore will accelerate very quickly and I gradually release pressure of my right rudder as the engine torque gets less and the aircraft gets more stable over time. Check your turn and bank indicator to see if the aircraft tends to go either way, but if done right you only have to release gradually the right rudder. The tail will lift around 130 kph and the rest of the aircraft will basically lift as soon as you hit roughly 200 kph. The faster you go the more stable the aircraft will get. And as soon as you are cleared the ground release your gain landing gear and reduce throttle to combat power or less. Common mistakes at takeoff are that the pilot forgets to lock the tail wheel, that they use the brakes to compensate for the torque which is a big mistake, only the rudder is really needed. Another mistake is that they overcompensate with the rudder and that they get into that left and right rudder pattern which makes things worse until they are spinning out of control. 
left rudder is just rarely needed for the takeoff. Sometimes if you are go going off course it can help, but generally speaking the engine torque is enough to bring you back on track just by releasing right rudder. Normally at that point I start to talk about the performance stats and uh, about things in the air after the takeoff. However, at this point I think it makes more sense to talk about the landing as it is part of the basics, I would say. So landing the F4 is in my opinion not really hard if you avoid some major fuck ups. And the first major fuck up you can avoid is to collide with mates which are already landing or are trying to take off. And for this I can highly recommend to fly over the airfield you want to land on at least once. Observe the ground, observe if the taxiways are busy, observe if, if other aircraft are landing and ideally you land from that direction where other pilots are taking off as well. If you do that you see guys taking off more easily, you see guys which are landing more easily and it's just a little bit easier and makes the takeoff and landing patterns more quickly overall. As soon as you are sure that the runway is clear and that you are clear to land, lose speed, align yourself with the runway and extend your flaps gradually and extend them fully as soon as you are below 250 kph and then you can drop your landing gear as well and you are ready for the landing. If you have sustained any battle damage in your sortie, check in the lower left corner if both green lights are lit and not red anymore. That shows that your both main landing gear legs are extended and working. Let your speed drop to around 200 kph and aim with your reticle at the beginning of the runway. As soon as you are a few meters above the runway, pull up, level out, cut the throttle even more and let the airspeed drop even more. Hold yourself as low as possible over the runway without touching down. The stall speed of the F4 with fully extended flaps is around 160 kph and as soon as you get close to that, pull up to position yourself in a 3 point attitude and let the plane touch down. As soon as you touch down, just let the aircraft roll and correct your path with rudder. Slow yourself down with tapping left and right wheel brake accordingly. I personally like to clear the runway with the rest of my speed. If you ha ever have to go around at final, don't apply full throttle at once. Throttle up carefully and slowly as otherwise the torque will turn your plane around and a crash is very likely at the moment. But other than that, a 109 is relatively stable at landing, at least in the air. As soon as you are on the ground, the narrow landing gear makes careful braking necessary, but as I said, other than that, it's relatively easy. Okay, let's take a look at the loadout of the F4 and by standard the F4 is armed with two with a propeller synchronized 7.92mm MGs and a single 20mm cannon firing through the propeller hub. If you want you can beef that armament up with additional MG151 cannons on the wings, either in the 15 or in the 20mm variant. I know the performance of the single 20mm cannon is sometimes lacking, but I personally don't like that the gondola cannons hamper the otherwise so good maneuverability, climb rate and other performance stats of the F4, so I prefer the standard armament overall. But I know some pilots are doing very well with the gondola cannons, but I guess that comes down to personal preference. I personally like to have that extra performance with just that 20mm cannon. Other than that, the F4 can carry four 50kg bombs or a single 250kg bomb for ground attack. The F4 is due to its not so great high speed handling and fragility, not a really good ground attacker. But sometimes it's really nice to have a single bomb to attack a tank or something, especially if no better fighter bomber alternatives are available. Another possibility in the loadout is that you can remove that nasty backplate to your rear and I highly recommend to do so. It vastly improves the rear visibility. You may ask now how more likely is it to get killed without that plate and my answer is I don't know. 
but maybe let's put it that way, I personally like to see what tries to kill me, so I like to avoid getting shot instead of hoping that that plate will rescue me. In the past I got sniped from Dead 6 regardless if I had that plate installed or not, doesn't offer that much extra protection anyway. A different story is the armored glass you can install in front of your windscreen. Maybe mainly psychological, but on the contrary to the backplate it has less disadvantages and offers some protection while attacking those ugly P2s for example. Yes, your visibility to the front is a little bit worse than, but that's basically it. Arguably the B409 F4 is the best one-on-one -on -one fighter of the simulation. It has the best climb rate, the best power to weight ratio, therefore accelerates very good. The F4 has awesome energy retention and even turns very well, especially at low speeds thanks to the engine power and the low weight and the extending leading edge slats. The F4 is the fastest fighter on medium altitudes between 2 and 6k and is at high altitudes only beaten by its successors the G2 and the G4. On the deck it's however beaten by the Yak1B and the LA5 and on a side note by the Focke-Wulf 190s. The engine management is fully automatic, the pilot has only to set the desired throttle and the aircraft systems does the rest. RPMs, prop pitch and radiator flaps are completely automatic, which was a luxury at the time. At 1.2 ATAR, which is around 63% throttle, the engine runs in continuous mode. If you throttle higher you enter the combat power region, which provides much more power, but is limited to half an hour at 1.35 ATAR, which is around 83% throttle. So basically you can fly half your sortie on combat power without worrying. If you throttle even higher the engine runs in emergency mode which gives you again much more power but is at full power only rated for one single minute. However I had to test that of course again in game and you can expect that your engine runs for one and a half minutes on full power roughly. On 95% for three minutes and on 90% for four and a half minutes. Keep in mind there is a random factor to it, it's not always the same, but you can surely squeeze more performance out of the engine than the limits are telling you. After going a while on emergency power you have to rest your engine a bit. The engine is basically able to replenish emergency power. In my experience after three to four minutes running on continuous power you have full emergency power available again. So at this point I hear many people already asking why the F4 is the fastest 109 if there are newer versions in the game in form of the G2 and the G4. And this is a very good question. Let me explain briefly without getting into too much detail as this is surely stuff for another video. One of the major changes from the F4 to the G2 was the new DB605 engine instead of the DB601. That brought more horsepower, but the new engine and some other novelties made the aircraft heavier. The main problem with the G2 is that at the time of introduction the engine had its fair share of problems. With a directive the G2 was limited only to 1.3 ATAR of boost to prevent sudden engine failures. That limit was only lifted in mid-1943. And this is exactly what we see in game. The G2 has only 1.3 ATAR available while being at the same time heavier than the F4. So it's absolutely no wonder that it's slower and climbs worse in comparison to the F4. Only at on altitudes above 6k the better supercharger of the new engine shines. The manifold pressure limit is lifted for the G4, so here we have full power available but uh, on the G4 we have a non-retractable tail wheel and the bulges on the wings for the bigger wheels of the landing gear. This hampers aerodynamics quite a bit and makes the G4 overall slower in acceleration and top speed. The climb rate of the F4 and the G4 are somewhat comparable but the F4 is on altitudes below 6k just faster. But again much more comparisons are a thing maybe for another video if I have the time for it. But back to the F4 and let us briefly take a look at the trim. 
Sadly, we only can trim the elevator axis in our F4. However, the trim is quite effective in all flight attitudes because it's not a tiny trim tab you control while trimming your plane, but it is really the entire elevator axis which moves. And that's the reason why you won't find the trim for the one lines in the settings. It's not called trim in the settings, but it's called adjustable stabilizer axis. I highly, highly recommend to set up uh, the trim for the 109 because it saved me a couple of times uh, from certain deaths and steep dives and it makes aiming so much easier. I highly recommend to use trim in the 109 extensively. One word on the flaps, those can be gradually extended from 0 to 40 degrees by holding down the flaps button. Keep in mind that the flaps take a bit long to extend and to retract. That can be really a hassle in a fight because the enemies, generally speaking, can extend and retract the flaps much faster. One final thing has to be mentioned here and this is the structural strength of the F4 or more precisely the lack of it. In dives this is fine for the most part, it's no problem to dive in steep angles and to achieve high speeds, you don't have to worry about speeds below 800 kph and above that you get warnings in form of shaking and fluttering of rudder and ailerons before they rip off. Problematic is the behavior when getting damaged by bullets or by flak. You easily lose wings, tail sections, even after minor hits. Minor coolant or oil leaks can result in engine seizures even after seconds or if you are really lucky after some minutes. The Russian 50 cal pierces the armor plate of the F4 without any problems and even if you have the additional armor plate installed. So you really don't want to be hit in your F4. In slow speeds the F4 is relatively stable unless the pilot uses the rudder and the elevator in a reckless manner and if the pilot is aware of the strong torque of the engine to the left and this makes takeoffs for new pilots relatively hard. But in a fight with flaps, if flown competently, the F4 can hold its ground even against the mighty yak in a turn fight. Thanks to the low weight of the airframe and high power output of the engine and the leading edge sluts. However, if the F4 is really close to stall speed, even with flaps, the high engine torque can cause a nasty stall which is really hard to recover. You feel like you are stuck in the air. This can be truly deadly as those situations are often take place on the deck. That stall can be avoided by staying of course at higher speeds or by leveling out and by throttling back a little to reduce that engine torque. At medium speeds between 300 and 600 kph the F4 really shines. Nimble at the controls and in my opinion easy to fly. The F4 wants to maneuver, Immelmanns, loops, spiral climbs, rolls, barrel rolls, everything is no problem. The F4 is the plane for fantastic aerobatics and in those maneuvers the F4 holds its speed very well and is able to get energy back very quickly. The control of the pitch is a little sensitive at times, but overall manageable, especially with trim. The trim gets even more important at higher speeds, approaching 600 kph and above. The controls of the F4 are beginning to lock up and making maneuvers hard to pull off. The elevator doesn't respond very well and the roll rate is abysmal, to be honest. Usually this is no problem if you want to dive away um, as the Russians are having their own problems at high speeds but lining up shots gets increasingly hard. Another thing is if you are heading towards the ground you can't pull up anymore because the elevator is locked up. That's the other moment where trim is really helpful as it is still working. The BF-09 series are often called energy fighters, a term I personally don't like because it puts a certain aircraft into a certain corner where it's not properly fitting, but the term energy fighter originates from the ability to easily gain an energy advantage, to keep it and even to increase it over the course of a fight. And it's of course always advantageous to start a flight from a clear energy advantage and with a good high altitude performance it's easy to achieve that in a F4. So I like to enter the target area between 3 and 5k 
kilometers depending on whether or if the enemies are already reported in higher altitudes and in the target area I work my way down if no enemies are to be seen on higher altitudes. So I work my way from higher altitudes to lower altitudes. Personally 3k is the lowest altitude I drop to while not being engaged. That's enough altitude to dive away if an enemy comes from higher up and enough altitude to bounce targets on the deck with a lot of energy surplus and at the same time 3k is a good altitude to spot targets still on the deck. If I see an enemy fighter below me I try to dive as quickly as possible below his low 6 and with a lot of speed. I open up fire if I'm closer than 200 meters. At that point the enemy fills out half of my gun sight and if I have the opportunity I aim for the wings and ideally the wing roots. That's a weak point of the Russians. They tend to lose wings or sometimes the wing tanks are catching fire. Um, I open up the fire at that close distance because my guns deal a lot more damage close up and another thing is I really want to get as many shots in before the enemy knows I'm there and if I open up fire at let's like, say 400, 500, 600 meters which I often see uh, when observing other teammates but the enemy can easily avoid the shots, sees a tracer, is turning away and then killing that guy becomes increasingly hard. If I get in really close, most of the time the enemy is severely damaged after that. And it's hard to miss if you are so close up. Of course you have to be really careful that you don't ram your enemy if you are closing in that fast. If I hit or miss, regardless I just push through after my attack in a shallow angle while keeping him inside or checking my 6. I see a lot of pilots climbing away in a spiraling maneuver upwards or even in a 90 degree climb straight up. Be very careful with those maneuvers. Yes, the F4 can climb very steeply and yes, the energy advantage is often enough to do that. But if the enemy prop hangs below you, this is sadly not enough of an advantage to get completely out of gun range. If you push through in the horizontally, you don't have that gravity working against your separation and you get out of range much more quickly. The shallow climb is additionally a great opportunity to scan your surroundings for other threats, while at the same time staying fast and safe. But sure, sometimes the energy advantage is big enough or the enemy's reaction to your attack allows to pull up again and mount attack after attack. And the Air Force maneuverability is ideal for that. But remember, that can be very dangerous, not only because of the propane kill by that guy you are already pursuing, but there could be other guys around you you don't see coming if you attack in rapid succession. But I personally like to attack in this style if I fight a single enemy behind my own lines where I don't expect somebody else. So to conclude, the ideal fighting style in the F4 is basically to spot enemies below you, to attack, to go through, reassess the situation and then you can decide to attack or disengage or whatever you want and you think is ideal for the moment. The disengagement maneuver, in quotation marks, is often just a, a continuation of that shallow climb or done by leveling out after the attack. I often disengage for a while until a complete new situation develops instead of committing against an enemy who knows I'm there. There are a few people around that think that a disengagement has something to do with a cowardice or something like this. That couldn't be further from the truth. You only are playing the cards you are being presented. Your F4 climbs very well, is very fast in comparison to the enemy. Why should you commit to a turn fight where it's unlikely that you win? Disengage, reassess, attack. Follow that pattern and you will be a very successful F4 pilot. Sadly, in the real world you don't have always the luxury of a clear energy advantage over the enemy. What you do then is highly, highly dependent on the situation and which fighter you meet on which altitude and if you are spotted or not and what the enemy pilot does. But the F4 is, unlike other aircraft, a really good aircraft to attack from the same energy state or even with a little bit less energy. 
The most simple situation where this is apparent is if you are seeing an enemy in front of you on the same altitude and the same speed and the enemy doesn't see you yet. He is for example climbing after a mate, like in the situation you see in the background footage. In such a situation it's absolutely clear what you have to do. Just open up the throttle, close in onto your enemy, exploit that he can't see to his dead six and shoot him down while climbing up. So, and if he's turning away, like in this situation, the F4 is absolutely capable of turning with your enemy. I just cut my throttle, I uh, stick to his 6 until I have shot him down. In this situation here, I had cover, I had a mate above me watching my 6, so turning was not really dangerous as long as I'm not overdoing it. But then there's of course the situation where both pilots are on the same energy level and both are seeing each other. This is very often in a head-on attitude, so both pilots see each other from a few kilometers away, um, they head towards each other, they meet in a head-on attitude, and your first goal in that situation should be to get as quickly as possible an energy advantage over your enemy. And the simplest way to do that is basically pass your enemy, and don't go for the head-on, don't give the enemy that chance to shoot you down, just pass him, avoid the guns and then start your shallow climb again I described earlier already. Observe him briefly what he does and very often the Russians just turn around as deeply as they can and the steeper that turn is the better it is for you because that turn of course burns a lot of energy, he can't recover so quickly. Especially on a little altitude you can gather energy very very quickly in comparison to the Russian fighters. Sometimes they burn that much energy in that turn that you basically can just loop around and you can attack then already from energy advantage or you can at least um, attack in a, yeah, in a slashing attack if that makes sense so the enemy has to avoid your guns and this evasion will cost even more energy which you can then exploit by gathering even more energy with a climb. So basically then you are back in the energy advantage and you can attack in the usual way in the F4. But if he has still some energy left after the initial turn, just continue your shallow climb and gather some energy. As a reminder, the shallow angle climb has a couple of purposes. The first, of course, is to get out and to stay out of his gun range using the F4 superior speed and climb rate. Secondly, it allows that you climb almost with that speed a Russian is capable of in to fly in a straight line. So the enemy can choose between either climbing directly after you and getting slower and slower because he can't keep up that climb, spending all his speed for a climb he cannot sustain, or alternatively, he can stay fast, but he can't climb with you then. And the third purpose is that you are much safer from other enemies you can observe while looking around in your climb. And even if you don't see another enemy, that enemy has as well a hard time catching you if he hasn't already a ton of energy. The fourth and the final purpose of that climb is that, you're, that you keep your escape window wide open. If you decide that the current situation is too dangerous, just level out and run. It's always possible to disengage them. If the situation is however good for another attack and you continued your shallow climb for a while, you will notice that the enemy either is below you because he was keeping straight or he is after a while running out of speed. It helps sometimes a little uh, to go into a wide spiraling climb. This costs the enemy even more speed and even more energy and after a while he will run out of speed and will be on the verge of the stall. And in those moments you can start some advanced maneuvers like uh, for example uh, the rope a dope maneuver where basically the enemy stalls out below you and you can drop on him um, at the top of your climb, deploy flaps so you don't stall too early, then drop with your nose onto your enemy and you can attack. But let's talk about another situation. Let's say you're behind your line, so over friendly territory, and you have met a single enemy and on the same energy state. If you want or if you have to, you can turn fight this enemy. This works especially against LA5s, LAGs, P40s and MiGs. All those fighters are generally speaking less maneuverable than the F4. 
The Air Force's biggest maneuverability advantage is at a very slow speed in comparison to Russian fighters. Uh, even against the mighty Yak-1, nothing I would build my fighting style on, but yeah, that works. And don't get me wrong, turning is always risky business. Turn fights are often complete chaos and very, very risky. Especially against experienced Russian fighter pilots who know their planes often very well and can exploit their strength and your weaknesses very good. So be very careful. For example, the slow extending flaps of the F4 in combination with the sluggish roll rate at medium to high speeds are things which get often exploited by experienced pilots. And yes, I said the F4 is very good at slow speed maneuvering, but that is no reason to get rid of all your speed. If then the enemy decides that he doesn't want to turn with you, then you are pretty much done, because he can just keep his speed and then you are boom and zoomed by yuck. Nobody wants that. In an energy disadvantage, however, you always should consider to disengage first before you think about anything else. This is of course not always possible if you have, for example, no altitude to work with or you have already an LA-5 on your tail on the deck and this guy is certainly faster than your F-4. As a reminder, LA-5s are faster on the deck than any B of all nine. But other than that, the Air Force performance is so good that you can turn many situations around if the enemy hasn't the opportunity to interrupt you while you are climbing or you accelerate. So I have two situations for you where I can turn the situation completely around. In the first situation I just shot down an enemy right on the deck next to an objective and I'm climbing away trying to get as much energy as possible and I don't want to do that right over the objective. So I climb to the northeast, basically away from the action. And shortly after breaking through the clouds I have an LA-5 diving on me. He is clearly in the energy advantage and I really don't like that. If I dive away just straight he can catch up sooner or later and if I continue climbing here he has even an easier time to get me. So I decide to let him get to me a little closer and then I do finally a uh, split S and I enter my shallow climb. At that moment he can't dive with me at that speed without risking structural damage but what he does wonders me a bit. He decides to do a horizontal turn on his altitude that kills a good portion of his speed. He was still faster than me for a while and he was getting closer but after a while we reached around 4000 meters and his engine was not working as good anymore. The LA-5 engine is optimized below 2000 meters and let's say above 3-4000 meters it's not really good anymore and it shows in that situation. He decides to climb with me, he loses a lot of speed, almost starts out, I dive on him and I'm able to destroy his rudder in this rope adobe maneuver. Note that my decisions here were not driven by how can I shoot him down, but it evolved from what gives me time to gather energy, the split S, to oh great I'm safe somewhere in the shadow climb and then oh I have an opportunity to shoot him down, that was on top of my climb after a while. So your first concern should revolve around how do I get out of that situation, the energy disadvantage, and then to turn this around if possible. Other than that, the disengagement should be always on your list. Another good method to equalize energy states is a dive, especially if the enemy is a lot higher than you. The dive can be steep, can be shallow, whatever keeps you out of gun range for the sufficient amount of time. If the enemy dives now on you, he gets faster and faster, basically he trades all his altitude for speed and reaches after a while his maximum speed and or a speed which is similar to yours. If you are still out of gun range at that point, you can now just slowly level out. The enemy can't get any faster than that, so and your energy retention is much much better. Fly a little while in a straight line until the enemy runs out of speed and gets slower. And then you can continue with the procedures we spoke earlier about. The shallow climb and all that jazz basically.
But that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and if you did, consider your support on Patreon. Those videos I create consume really a lot of time and effort. But if you don't want to, that's fine as well. Dropping an iron cross via a carrier pigeon is totally enough. See you in the next one.